Let us get to the next Well, at a high um, level. So what we've shown so far, because we're showing how we build stuff, right? And so the next part is to go in and show you how to use that and what that would look like in like a business intelligence tool or in the marketplace where we think most people will go to get stuff. Okay. So just like the architecture itself, we've got like a broad mix of people that are interested in this and understanding it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You got it? Okay. <laughs> so hopefully folks can hear me online too. I guess I didn't check that. Do you have us out in virtual land? Yeah, we can hear you. Nope, not at all. Not at all. Thanks, Cole. <laughs> Thanks, Cole, for confirming that we can't hear you. Yes, either. <laughs> Um, we would say whatever Paul said. Um, so, yeah, we've got people that really want to see all of the details and the physical environment, and we got it. And so, this will, this next section will be more bring it around, bring it around to the business part right. and how like expect most people to access it. And um, and really, the goal is. Like all of this, all of this detail, it, to some extent, like we hope at some point in time, nobody cares about it because we just, or, or the only the people that actually need to be involved in making decisions about the business rules or if I have data engineers that build it, right? And then, but the, we know that the majority of people are, they just want to be able to go to a place, say, I want to find some data about fire occurrence and weather. And get some have a catalog that says, okay, here's some data sets about this. Here's the detail about it. So we can look at it and go, oh yeah, let me take a look at this data set. Oh no, that one's not gonna work for me. Let me oh, that one will work for me. And then I wanna, you know, and so it becomes more of a point and click, click and drag type thing where they don't really have to want to minimize as much work as possible. Things find what they want to find, use it the way they want to use it. And yeah, that makes sense. But to get the data modeled so that it's easy for them to say Power BI, like that's what this is all the work that we're doing behind the scenes to make it easy for them to put to drag this data in Power BI and develop a dashboard in work. Okay. Yeah. okay. We'll see. Okay. BI. Yeah. I was, I was say so, BI, by the way, I, it's not part of our package, our old 365 package that they offer to us. Doesn't come with it. Yeah, and we're, we're like we're getting the data ready for whatever tool somebody is using. Whether okay. they're using Power BI or they're using Tableau or they're using, you know, to some extent, we don't really care what tool they want to use for business intelligence. They want to build a dashboard. We just want to make sure that the data is modeled in such a way that it's easy for them to do that and that they can find that data and it's accessible easily so that they can build their dashboards with whatever update frequency they want to have and all that type of stuff. So it's about documenting and defining the data and making it accessible um, for a variety of tools. Okay. And speech. Jacob. Hold his hand down. Okay. Exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah, and the way I would put it is that if, if, if this was simple, what we had shown before, it'd be a lot harder for you, right? If it's hard over here, if it looks complex, it's because we're taking the complexity and managing it and then making it simple to everybody else. Hopefully, I guess it makes sense. Don't get hung up on any of the tools because I always say the tools don't matter. They're all pretty good. They all work pretty well. If you've got a good tool, just keep it and use it. Right? Control manager. Support service. 
their license for capital and capital EI and they won't support confidence anymore. So we'll run into that. Yeah, but the thing is, if we're, you know, the if you structure this well, right, then if when you take a tool like Cognos out of the environment and you drop a new tool like Power BI or Tableau in, it doesn't really matter because the data is defined and we know where it is. And so through the tool, like Carlos was saying, the tool becomes less critical to your ability to actually get information. Out of it. To the story studio, we're doing ad hoc origin of queries. Uh, Power BI has something that's kind of similar to the other half of the flexibility of the power of the cosmos ad hoc origin. We'll talk about that. Okay. So, we think we can help with that. Craig has his hand up. Craig. Uh, yeah, I just asked a question before lunch um, on the chat, and um, it may be answered during this next presentation, but it had to do with uh, Carlos's diagram with Snowflake, and I don't know if you saw that in the chat, but um, I've been using it in a evaluation mode, and just wondering, um, I have some snippets that uh, I've got about 20 iterations of each one, and I want to keep a history of each one as they start to morph into a little more complex uh, sequences. And I, and I was wondering, is uh, is the data or is the uh, uh, discovery zone, is that the place where we can put these so that we have like a legacy of all the work we have? Because my evaluation uh, version, I clogged it up. <laughs> Maybe that's just uh, uh, the issue with that, but I, I wasn't able to have more than a few of these uh, set aside. So, um, and then plus my last part of that question is, is it too early to talk about how that discovery zone is going to be administered as far as like, um, you know, what is going to be the retention cycle and if there's uh, ways to uh, retrieve this data and then uh, these these little snippets and whatever we have in there and then disseminate them to other users. So I, I'm not sure what the snowflake answer is. I think I'm sure I know the evaluation version is highly limited, right? And how many you, you can only use the smallest instance and limited amount of space and things like that. So I, I don't know the parameters of the evaluation version. So it just could be that you bumped up against that. When you say it's clock, you're saying you're saying you can only store uh, you can only create like so many schemas. I think there might be a limit on that too. I guess if that's what you're kind of getting at or or that exactly can... that's it. Is that exactly Carlos? Yeah, I can only have so many schema. And uh, and so I was building these uh, uh, kind of data preparation uh snippets so that it could be ingested into tableau's um their data prep tool and like i said i think i had 25 and that was it and so um so like i, I mean, said it may be an issue with that in the sounds like yeah there's no such problem right it's you can go petabytes right and not have you know, other than worrying about paying for it you don't have to worry about getting it or building it right so um so unlimited space, basically, and you know, a, a lot of computer resources. So you don't. Those are just evaluation version issues, I guess. Um, you know, Snowflake has a powerful thing. That you can clone. Uh, you can clone tables, schemas, databases, and it's really easy to do. So it allows you to keep different snapshots of things if you want to. So the fact that you can clone you know, means that you end up creating a lot more data and a lot more space using a lot more space. And again, no issues with that. In fact, it's one of the features. It also has another thing called time travel that allows you to look at previous versions of your data, even if you didn't save them or store them that way. So there's a lot of there's a lot of features like that that you know if you're trying to keep different versions of data, it, it makes it really really. Okay, awesome. Oh, I'll be looking forward to that for sure. As far as the discovery zone is concerned, I think it's like that's an organizational and governance type issue, right? I mean, very loose governance, right? Because discovery is not intended to be governed, but how, what data you have there, how often you have it, how how long you can keep it. I mean, a lot of times when we recommend it to a, somebody, either we might say, well, 90 days seems like a good good number. 
but there's really no good reason to even cap it at any, you know, you know, you, you can you can keep data in your discovery zone usually as long as you want. Okay. Don't pull the whole data lake house into your discovery zone every day and keep multiple versions of it, right? Because there's no reason right. now you're paying for it, right? But as far as like how it gets managed and all that, I mean we're a little bit too high level right now to even determine that, I think. Okay. Okay, copy that. Okay. But if you're right, it's 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 for your own use, so you use it however you you want, right? That's really the intent. Okay. Great. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Be administered except by yourself. So your own your own space. Who had a question in the back? Uh just a question you what we were talking about the tools and, and it goes back to Ivy's question earlier. Look at your different applications because we were looking. We use ServiceNow for IROC, and that doesn't connect to Snowflake necessarily, but it can go through Matillion. So, just something to kind of put into the, your perspective when you're choosing those those tools with the outside entities that would be feeding. So, I would look at it the other way. Actually, I would say ServiceNow is the right solution for you. It's up to us to figure out how to get data from. Awesome. Because don't change that. Decision because of uh, oh we wouldn't because of the name <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're in service now for the long haul man yeah <laughs> yep well and I think that's you know that's part of the the challenge that we gave them with this architecture right but it's not really unique to us so I mean to be clear we're not special in any way <laughs> we think we are but really everybody has these types of issues and like Carlos was saying earlier like. We have all of these different data sources and they're all in different types of software and versions and stages and so I wanted an architecture that was data from an excel spreadsheet in the sharepoint or an oracle database or you know whatever whatever right so so that's really how we intended this to be able to function and so the fact that you know Snowflake may not have a, a connector directly for Salesforce right now probably isn't important to the no. until it does, but even if it's it specifically service now, government service now. Yeah, I actually did that on a call with one of them. Was with one and called it the other. Service now, Salesforce. Okay. Um. So there's so Susan has some questions on the chat. Um, so can we already use NIST services and Power BI? I feel like this is great to have your data that I see a loss of the geospatial capabilities. And so so I I kind of look at it this way, Susan. Um, the geospatial data, and especially when we talk about things like the National Association Service, like okay, our perimeter data flows. Uh, all of that, like, we don't want to replace, we use no way, shape, or form of trying to replace ESRI the, or any other geospatial data capabilities, right? Like, that is a, that is a unique way of managing our data and we want to continue on doing that. But the thing that I get excited about is I'm not a GIS person, and so you expect me to go any more than, like, selecting layers? On a viewer, like I'm probably not going to be a bunch of views, right? And it stop. But what this does allow us to do is, and we've always had this conversation about well, what do we do with our geospatial data? How do we do, you know, it's like we act like these are two distinctly different things that don't touch each other. And the reality is that there's a whole lot of overlap. And the thing that I got really excited about is that is that with some of these capabilities and as that we've been talking about is I could suddenly start seeing how our spatial data and our tabular data would come together in a way that we could enhance both. It goes it goes both ways. It's not just being able to take the spatial data and flatten it out so that it so that a non-spatial person could use it and get value from it, but also that we can attribute our spatial data back, right? Like there's, it, it's, it starts becoming more integrated. And while I don't understand all of the details of it yet, 
um, I think those are good use cases for us to start exploring it. So I would look at it as uh, well, Steve Manti's got it on his um, tagline, right? The right data, the right time, at the right place. Well, and so it's the right tool to what's the right tool for what you're trying to accomplish. And so we're not in any way saying, any way saying that IPME is going to replace the tools that you're already using. But it might be enhanced work that you're already doing. And um, so look at it that way. Think about that. Does that help, Susan? Yes, that was helpful. And I was looking at it that way. I'm trying to wrap my head around it a little bit. You know, I understand we have technical limitations, 2000 feature limit. Um, that's overcomable in some cases in JavaScript and, and using some other some other methods. Um, but I get what you're saying. And, and I and I am seeing the utility of this from a research side of the house. Um, but I also feel there's a danger in creating a disconnect between the geospatial and the tabular data. Um, that kind of worries me a little bit that we don't look at 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 it more holistically. I hope we're I hope we are looking at it more holistically and that it, and so keep asking and poking at us if you feel like we're not because the goal is that is that we're looking at wildland fire data. So what data supports um, wildland fire operations and our missions and our programs and the fact that it's spatial or tabular is kind of secondary. We need to, it's, it's what, how do we get the information that we need? Um, so, so keep, keep poking at that and keep asking about that. The Andrew Business Intelligence is the product class and it's really broad and like Power BI is specific to the gap. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, the other thing is that, it, you know, back to Cognos, like, you know, some people have struggled with Cognos, but the fact is, Cognos is a super powerful tool that's designed for data scientists, right? And Power BI is is kind of a lighter version of that that maybe feels a little more accessible. But at the end of the day, those tools like that, they like you really have to understand the data before you just click and you know drag and drop these fields together to get really crazy answers. And so that doesn't really change with tools like that. I mean, they can put some things in place that might give you a little warning that says, hey, you might think about this, right? But nonetheless, these are choices. And so it's incumbent upon us to have our data documented and described in such a way that both humans and machines can understand that because if we do want the machines or the software to be able to say, hey, this doesn't really seem like this, you should this is going to get you what you want, right? We have to have told it and given it enough information and described things clearly enough for it to understand and help us with that. So it's so really just remember, you know, we're showing you some tools because uh, because that's how most people are going to interact with the data is through some sort of tool. But just keep in mind, these are examples of tools that you could use, and this just happens to be the one that we pick to demo something. But the focus is on how do we get the data ready, how do we make the data available, and how do we use the data? So with the Power BI, we're in the process of migrating to um, Power BI from Cognos. All of our reports are paginated, tabular, format driven, which the cloud premium version of Power BI doesn't support. So they have another tool that's an on prem that you install that will build those types of reports. So, so I we think have, that, so Carlos, that may be, I mean, like, it's, I think that what we're trying to do is like get ahead of that so that you don't have to try to <laughs> even do that. I mean, that we're, Structuring the data in such a way that we, yeah. So I don't know if maybe you can think about well, that. Well, I think you're you're talking about paginated reports, right? Mm -hmm. so, right? Which look kind of like traditional reports, right? Or forms, or forms, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And so the, uh, power creating in my reports server building. Yeah. So again, I mean, I think that you know the distinction, right, is is that. Power BI, kind of the vanilla Power BI tool is a dashboarding tool, right? So if you're using just vanilla Power BI, you're going to use it to create dashboards. 
and the data architecture supports that, right? But um, if you want to build any type of, uh, you know, traditional report, you know, longer, you know, detailed report, paginated report, or even like a, what an SSRS would have done or anything, that the data still supports that, that architecture still supports it. It's really about, how, you know, how much do you want to use a tool maybe for what it's not intended to be, right? I mean, I can take Power BI and build a table out of it and try to build a big long table, but it's not ideal, right? right. So that may be the limitation you're talking about, but the Power BI licensing has gotten pretty convoluted. Um, I believe so the premium allows you to fail paginated reports, a, a, a premium license for an individual. Yeah, so the USDA bought the uh, Power BI Pro. Pro. Which and then the uh, desktop version is what everyone needs. The Forest Service bought a premium license because we needed to do uh, more publishing, like publishing to the web, and then to do our paginated reports, we then had to use Report Server plus Builder, but it falls under the same license. Um, but it's like a, it's a it's a separate desktop tool that you have to use. You're taking the old report builder tool that came with SSRS, right? Yeah, it's kind of their legacy. Um, with premium, you should be able to paginate reports today. Right, we can discuss later. Yeah, we can. It's, yeah, I mean, I think that's available today. Okay. Yeah, we can talk offline. Any other questions or thoughts for lunch? Okay. Well, that's I might get back up. Share my screen again. Thank you. Hey, Susan, while Mike is, is bringing this up, maybe another way to kind of think about this as well as uh, like the tools that you're using to create data in and to do specific business functions and operations, like we're not talking about any of that. All of that's going to stay in place as appropriate. This is about how we bring the data in from multiple sources and whether that's different applications or spatial data and tabular data. It's all about how we bring divergent data together and process it, transform it, and manage it in such a way that it becomes usable for multiple purposes. So that might be another way to kind of think about that with the spatial data that we were talking about here. Okay. So piggybacking off Power BI, here's Power BI. <laughs> So with this data we've been and talked about, I'll start with our uh, incident time analysis dashboard that we put together. Some of it may be a little bit difficult to see. Talk through it a little bit. So with the issues that everybody was having with time zones, local time, and everything like that, we decided maybe we should visualize it. And so Emmy and I came up with a couple of different metrics and things that we might we think might be important. It might not be important to you guys. So the first thing was, well, what time locally are all of these incidents occurring during? Or what's the time range? So Carlos talks a little bit about building those different time groups into the time dimension. So we have this one we've built here. I think we've broken uh, the day up by every three hours. And so this is I have filtered on last year in the uh, Rocky Mountain GAC. And we can see the, the states that are highlighted. And so these incidents, the majority of incidents are between this top one is at mid afternoon, 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, and this next one is 12 to 2 p.m. So we can see locally most of these incidents are being discovered between 12 and 5. So maybe we need to have more resources available during those times during fire season. This can we can add other filters and things like that to this, but this just shows now we can look at incidents by their local discovery time. And then 
this is the average discovery time by month. And so it's still filtered into that same gap for 2022. And so we can see this yellow is all time, all gaps. And this is my selected year and my selected gap. And so we're seeing that in 2022 fires were starting almost an hour later in May than we did last year compared to the all time average. And so maybe we can do some other resource planning and staffing to make sure, okay, we need people, we're seeing fire starting in later. Why is that happening? Let's do some more analysis. Let's do some more digging. Um, why, are, why are they an hour later this year compared to all time? And maybe it's, we've had a dry May. And so things are drier and we're seeing more fires or we've had worse thunderstorms in May. We're seeing more lightning strikes or something like that. So we can dive a little bit deeper. Um, but this is just kind of a, an executive kind of high level dashboard that shows some new possibilities we have with the data to start looking at incident discovery time in the local time zone. And so I'll just go through a couple of other dashboards. Uh, so this is more of a historical look at incidents. And by historical, I mean year to date. So this is kind of looking at everything what's happened since the first of the year. So we've had 37,000 incidents. Um, an interesting thing I saw from using this data set is there's multiple ways of calculating acres. So there's an incident size value uh, in the data set. And when we sum that, we get 3.3 million acres. There's also a calculated acres. Uh, value in the data set and when we sum that we get 1.5 million acres. So I happen to say this is what we're actually going to use to calculate acres because someone could go in there and say we've had almost 3.4 million acres burned this year. And another person could say no you're wrong I am I'm only saying 1.5. And so once we start developing the data and modeling it in this way, then we can ask further questions and then dive deeper and make the data even better. And so even right now, I don't know which one of those is right. And so maybe that's a conversation we have is, you know, which one is right or which one is closer to being right? And is that the one we want to use as our <laughs> sort of golden number or golden, uh, golden value? So this is this visual here is just a unique power BI heat map that is progressing throughout the month. Um, this animate is slowly changing, so it's kind of showing the progression of fire season this year. And then uh, this is just incidents by month uh, currently. And so it's just a trend of incidents this year. And this can also be filtered by state, by GAC, by jurisdictional unit or agency, and really anything else that we have available in this data set. Two other ones I wanted to show. We have something similar, but it's just being done for all time. So this is number of incidents of all time, this large incidents. Um, Made up. I thought a large incident would be a thousand acres, but you know that can easily be changed. Uh, the thing to highlight on this dashboard is these are the number of incidents by the fuel model used to make the prediction of the fire behavior. So this is kind of where we're tying in those other use cases of we have a code in the informed data set that points to data from edge. And we're combining those. And so now we can drill in and get more detail on and not just look at these by a code that you and I might not know, but maybe some specialized person knows. Uh, now we can see there were 6,000 incidents for low, low, dry climate and grass. Uh, and then we can drill up and drill down and see what that looks like. Set this up, right? And we can expand the hierarchy to so the lowest level of data. We can drill up and group these in other ways. And so now we're able to, to now we're in low load model. 
information that's not available when you're just looking at the informed data set. Um, and here, um, it looks like there's a lot more data for incidents starting in 2020. I don't think that there was just a meteoric rise in number of incidents starting in 2020, but we just don't have the data for it. So that's so maybe somebody needs to go and track those incidents down and uh, so we can further uh, expand the data we have to look at. They did have a record year in 20. I was like, yeah, <laughs> that actually could be accurate. They did. Well, I think uh, so when we showed, shared this with the data management committee, um, Steve Blair, I don't know if Steve's on right now, but um, his reaction was that that jump was expected based on what um, some of the stuff that they knew was going on. But what that does is it points to how critical it is that we are including good metadata and documentation about this, because if this is, uh, you know, as a result of changes in policy, changing applications, changing, you know, all of those types of things that we do all the time in our environment, you know, this is an expected thing because we've done something to make the data better or have more complete data. That's great, right? But we don't want it to get misinterpreted. So this is where that getting that good metadata and those definitions and descriptions and good standards like the work that we were, that Kara uh, and, and others did on that data exchange, incident data exchange standard, right? Like that's the beginning of us starting to get into going beyond saying this is a data element, this is what it means, this is the format of it, right? Which is where we've been with data standards to getting into this is an this is an incident record and this is what it looks like from the time that's created in the computer aided dispatch system until it goes into the final fire reporting system and we get as aggregated in the IDME and this is how you, you know here's the things you should get so like all of those types of things have to start coming together in a way that People don't misinterpret the data. Now they can misuse the data because when we have <laughs> open data, right? People get to do what they want with our data, but if we have to do our best to document it so that if they do use it inappropriately, it doesn't come back on us. We can say, you know, we told you this was the intended use, this was the the you know purpose. <laughs> so, but I think that that's a really that's a great thing to look at and go, oh, shoot, what does that mean? And how are we going to capture, first of all, what does that mean? And second of all, how do we communicate out to people whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or what it means? So I guess I can show two more. So this was a little visual that uh, Rochelle asked me to put together and this is so when we're doing the time zone processing if a lat long is not valid or not in a time zone polygon we can spit that out as sort of an exception report and take a look and see what happened why is this data not looking good why is it not a valid lat long why is something's wrong with it so let's take a look so um, I think the first time I showed this there were 20,000 of these, so something changed and they're a lot better. So we're seeing five incidents where maybe that's an invalid lat long or it's not in the United States or something's wrong. And so this is just a place we can go to make our data better. And so if you're, uh, let's say you're working in California and then you come on this page and you see there's, there's one incident that has bad data. Well, I can go in and, and make sure that data is right. So I'm reporting on this actor. So this is this is kind of pointing to new capability that we haven't had before, right? So you know, I remember back in the day when doing VLM fire reporting, right, and trying to get the year to pull data together to see how many districts had completed their fire reports and who hadn't, and then making you know. It was like a, a very manual, laborious process to figure that out, right? Or I had to write some sort of formulas in Excel and, you know. And so what we want to do is start thinking about data quality and how we can um, elevate in assessing our data for quality 
and identifying where there are issues so that we can get them corrected sooner and finding them before some user gets stuck with data that they can't use because we haven't cleaned it up appropriately. So, you know, that's those are very aspirational goals. And but as we start getting better tools, it starts making that type of stuff easier. And so um, so that was I, I was like, yeah, let's see how how are there ways that we can see this data and start understanding the issues in the data and elevating those in a way that we can start acting on it. And the last one I want to show. This one. So when we were meeting with Travis, I don't know if Travis is still on, he pulled up, I believe the software was called Fire Family Plus, and he was showing a couple of the visuals that he wanted to recreate in Power BI and was having trouble. And so these were the visuals that he showed me. I can, somewhere I have a screenshot of it, but he wanted to compare uh, incidents by year with the number of acres that burned that year. And so that's what this is doing. So in 2020, uh, we had 14,000 or 14 million acres that burned and we had less incidents. So maybe that was a year where we had a lot of larger ones. And so this allows a little bit deeper insight into this and is kind of showing that we can do what Fire Family Plus is doing also. So Travis is on. So Travis, you want to talk a little bit about why you asked us to do this? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think for those people that are familiar with Fire Family Plus, you're familiar with how um, important it is in the uh, fire business decisions that we make in terms of doing our analysis, but it's very, very static. You get to look at one report and about fire currents, and that's it. Um, by kind of expanding our minds a little bit, we can start to uh, do things like look at cause by month and drill into the data and have an interactive report rather than something that's very static um, and just opens the door to all sorts of um, learning about the incidents that we have. So. So really, this was, if I recall our conversation, it was about that when you get like one of these graphs from Fire Family Plus, like it's that's it, you can't go any further, but by replicating the views in this type of environment, then it's that ability to drill down and explore that enhances what you've already got in Fire Family Plus, right? Yeah, so Mike, I don't know if you can, if you've got it set up so you can uh, go across it, but maybe like click on one of the year bars and see what it does to the, It looks like it's maybe not cross referencing to like the cause I would expect. Um, normally, if you have the the graphs um, set up, you'll be able to see by year uh, where where your causes are. So you may see different trends occur from year to year or month to month. But I mean, that's part of a lot of different dashboarding tools is that ability to um, cross reference across different visuals. Yeah, they may not have set up this across yeah. filter. I think I just told you this like last week or week before. So for folks saying, I mean, it's it's definitely um, a little coarse right now, but it it has a lot of potential in terms of rethinking how we um, do our fire business analysis. Yeah, and I think that's the thing, right? This is like where we want to be able to get to is when Travis says, I, I, I asked them to do this a couple of weeks ago, right? And that's not perfect, right? I feel like the concept, but we want to get to that point where the, if it's not immediate, if you can't do it yourself, and I'm at Ramona Carey, the um, ACO for Forest Service, uh, use the phrase, govern self service analytics. And that's really that self-service component, right? Like we want you to be able to get what you want and, and not have to 
take it from anybody else to say, hey, can you add this or can you redo this for us or can you, you know, we want you to be able to get the data that you need for your purpose today and be able to answer that question today. Now, if we have to do some other stuff, like initially, it's going to take time for us to build that capacity. But even with that, the thing that I'm seeing with this and what I've seen with, with the work that Mike and Carlos have done is, you know, they can just do stuff so fast in here that it's like, it's just mind blowing sometimes that how, how quickly they can take something that was really like Travis is static and dry before and all of a sudden it becomes enriched and much more flexible and exciting. So I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, we can enable like drill down functionality as well. So similar to what Travis was saying with the cross filtering, if we click on this in the tool tip pop up, another visual that has a table of all this data. So you can go in and see all of the incidents from 2022 or your specific state or district or wherever kind of filters you want on it. So you can dive deeper in from this main summary screen. Are there any other questions, comments on the dashboarding side of things? There's been a whole lot of chat going on as far as the calculated acres versus incident side of yeah. All of that, that's also a topic. That's kind of like time. <laughs> so the last thing we built out was a data marketplace. For those of you who were in Texas or joined uh, on that call. We were using a product called Narrative. It's still kind of in the evaluation phase of these different marketplace products. It's a very new technology, and so a lot of these are very young and, and pretty lightweight. And so for this third use case, we went with a product called Harbor. <laughs> um, it's very similar to Narrative. Um, there's a couple other features in Harbor that we like, um, and I'll kind of walk through what those are. Those of you who don't know what a marketplace is, a marketplace is, I guess the way I like to think of it is Amazon for data, right? If you need a new water bottle and you're at home and you need it in two hours, what do you do? You go on Amazon and order it, it's delivered in two hours. That's kind of like what, just a second. <laughs> in Denver, we get it in two hours. <laughs> so the same thing with this data marketplace, right? Say I, uh, I somebody asked me a question and I need to go find the answer. Well, I come here, I can search by category. So I'm looking for fire environment. Okay, so here's the data related to fire environment, and I can use that to go uh, answer my question. So if I click on a product, this is kind of what the marketplace looks like. Uh, we have some tags here, so public weather, fire environment. We have a little description of what this. Uh, what this data product looks like. So a data product is kind of a product like you would buy on Amazon, like a water bottle or literally anything. Um, and in the data marketplace, there's a concept of a product, which is what you buy and subscribe to. I'm saying buy, but in this scenario, we're not paying for anything. Uh, we have a product which you subscribe to, and a product can be made up of multiple assets, which is the other concept here. And an asset can be any type of data. It can be a connection to Snowflake. It can be a connection to an FTP site. It can be a CSV file from your computer. It can also be a PDF. It can be a Word document. Really, any type of data is what an asset is. And so, when we talked about narrative in Texas in April, narrative had one asset per product. And so one of the features of this tool, Arbor, is it can be, you can have multiple assets per product. So this is one of the products that we showed in, te uh, in Texas. So there's one asset, it's one table. Um, it's a really wide view of the first POC or the uh, Tool samples that we did. So it's, I think it's six tables joined together with no filters on it. And it's just one really wide CSV file. Um, 
But when you have a product where you can have multiple assets in the product, you have a lot more flexibility in what you can subscribe to and also how you can work with the data. So we have this fire. This is the other version. No, this is not the right version. We have this fuel samples, which is the same exact data, but it's now broken up into the individual tables that it exists in, in Snowflake. And so when we create these products, we can give it whatever assets we want to. If we're working on a specific topic or a specific data set, or we're working in a specific region, we can give it whatever assets or whatever data we want. Uh, and we can also embed Power BI into it. So if there's value in saying this is the data that is used to build this dashboard. This is kind of our source of truth for these types of questions. And the dashboard can live inside of the product. So I have access to it so I can sign in. And here's the dashboard we showed for the first uh, demo in Texas. So we have the data, the dashboard, and within the product, there's also a way to interact with it. So, and I can, this dashboard's fully interactive. I can go in here, I can change the dates, I can, you know, select wherever I want, and it'll, it's a fully operational dashboard. Have we done miss anything on the marketplace? Um, not on the fuel samples, but like for the fire occurrence data mark, since we took that from behind the FC board, this is would be um, internal only. So like on the page prior, you can click internal and just see you know, like what's internal. And um, anyway, that one was internal. I might need to refresh. So that you can keep track of the data and how it was. Yeah, it's tagged internal here. Okay. And maybe because I'm part of the NFC Harbor organization, it mm -hmm. doesn't seem different to me. But if I wasn't, I wouldn't be able to see it. So you can track the data throughout, you know, whether it's public internal. Um, and then there's an incident tag. So just that tagging can be pretty powerful right now because we're using a demo version of a bunch of tags we're not using. Um, but when it's our business, we'll have tags that are very relevant to what we're doing. Actually, yeah, can this be used for like hand reports and subscriptions with like a SSRS where you sign up for the subscription and you'll get an email and that data set's been for this uh, um, data set has been updated or? Yes. Okay. And uh, yeah. uh, can you export these or bring them out if you say an Excel spreadsheet or something like that and do a subset or do you need to download the whole thing? Yep, you can download anything. So we have the concept of products. Products are what you can subscribe to or buy. Um, and so I'm subscribed to this Fire Occurrence Data Mart. I can click Export Product, and there's a number of ways I can get it. There's also a way to get it programmatically through an API. Um, and so the options, at least currently with this Marketplace product, I can download it and I can download it. I can download it as a parquet file, a CSV, a tab delimited file, and it's a JSON file. Um, I can put it on an FTP site. I can download it to any of the major cloud uh, storage buckets. Thank and so, thank you. Yeah. yeah so, this is kind of the last part of the shopping. Once you subscribe, well, then what do you do with it? So you download it and you can, you know, add, if you're working in Power BI, for example, you can download this as a CSV file and add that to enhance the data you're visualizing. Um, and there's another concept in this marketplace specifically called a space. Uh, a space that's going to look a lot like what the discovery zone looks like. And so, I've created this workspace. When you create a workspace, what it does is you get to pick what tools you want to work in. So the workspace is a, an area where you can develop your own data products. You can develop your own code. You can also publish code and data products from the workspace. 
so other people can uh, use them. So if you're an analyst, you develop a really slick machine learning model that accurately predicts the number of incidents tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody should use that, right? And so we can develop that in this workspace, and then we can also publish that in this workspace so other people can subscribe to it. And so the workspace is we can give anybody or nobody access to them. Um, and so, so if you want to do data science or interact with these data products, you subscribe to via SQL, via Python, via R. Uh, you, you can create a data science workspace. There's some other ones as well. This is more for visualization. Um, and they're continuously adding other types of uh, environments where you can mess around with this data. So once you set all this up, then you add your data to the workspace. So these are the two products that I have subscribed to. So I can pick whichever ones I want to interact with in the workspace. Uh, in the example I have set up, we have this fire occurrence data mark, which is kind of the data that I was showing earlier. It's the informed data set that has been advanced with the edge and USDOT data. And so I can also add collaborators from within this environment. So if Carlos wanted to work on it or we're collaborating on some research project, I can add him and we're both working in the same environment with the same data. So once I get that created, there's a couple of ways I can access the workspace. The workspace is essentially a compute resource that is spun up in the background that allows me to work and interact with the data. So I can either download this Amazon Workspaces app and use this client to access it, or I can access it from my browser. So now I'm inside my workspace. This is what it looks like. I can launch SQL Lab. I can launch Jupyter Lab, R Studio, SuperSet, which is another SQL editor. Um, and that's running on this machine that the workspace is connected to. It's not using any of the resources. Trisha. Somebody for each of these workspaces that get spun up, do we know what like the price model looks like? And these are all open the source. So the only cost with using a workspace is the compute resource that you're using. And that is charged to the subscription holder of the platform, at least in their current model. So that would be IDM 83. So I think that it's fun. Yeah, well, and and so so I would first say, you know, if you didn't pick up on Mike saying this is that this is like the second or third marketplace that we're testing out because these are all good, right? So we're not saying this is the solution, right? But what this does is it gives us an opportunity to start exploring capabilities. And so in the original data cache requirements analysis. One of the concepts that the community had was that there's a single authoritative place to go to get interagency data. Okay. Well, so to, to have a single authoritative place to go, right, is not a, a simple thing. I mean, that's that's a huge thing. And part of the concept is I don't want to have to go log in to six different databases and download data and merge it myself to be able to answer my question. I want to go to one place and be able to get data from different sources and do my analytics or, or develop the product that I need to develop. So this marketplace concept is a, is a way that we can do that. And so starting to explore some of this stuff, then we get to start going beyond the idea of I want a single authoritative place to go to get interagency data which is a great big concept, right? And everybody's like, yes, let's do that. But when we get to start looking at some of this, we can start going, oh, well, what does that mean about this? Or what does that mean about that? And, and so this just starts taking us into that next layer of understanding what we thought we meant when we said that versus what we really probably should be considering and thinking about, right? So. That's one aspect of it. Um, and so how we figure out like who would have access to something like this, how they would be, how they would use processing time, 
how we manage the cost for that. Those are all things that we that we get to work through as we start understanding what this means. But it's really about starting to get you to think, oh, if I had one place that I could go and I could get data from these multiple sources, and what would I do with it then? What does what does my world look like then versus what I'm having to do now in order to do my work? Joe? I just had a question, and that is having gone through the AGOL revolution, if you will, um, and how much people have been producing and not organizing and the old stuff that gets there and keeping it clean and organized and all that kind of stuff. I think for using for a marketplace for an authoritative data source, that makes a lot of sense. But how far beyond does it go where we're letting or we're where people, where users are utilizing these types of environments to make their own products, and what kind of management do we see coming with that in the future? So I think that those are those are conversations that we as a collective need to have, and um, and we have to look at what resources we're willing to invest to support delivery of capabilities. Um, and and so I, I think those are, are things that we have to look at and think about as a community. Um, but I will say, and I continue to keep the focus on utilize, you know, thinking about open data concepts, right? So we have a mandate to make our data available. We don't have a mandate to control what people do with our data. Mm -hmm. And so so We've got to make our data available. We've got to document and define and describe it the best that we possibly can. And to some extent, like I, you know, if I want to keep our focus on that because I think that's where we have um, the ability to influence and create value. But I wouldn't want to be in the business of saying we're going to create one dashboard for all the gaps and every gap is going to use this one dashboard. Or, you know, it, that is that to me is a losing battle. Like, I, I mean, it just is, it just feels like insanity to try and do something like that. I'd much rather say, here's the data, go knock, <laughs> quote Steve Larry, go knock your bad self out, right? Like, go do whatever you want, but just follow, please follow, read what we've said about our data, follow the recommendations that we have about using our data. And then if you want to create 10 different dashboards for yourself, I don't care. Just use authoritative data. So to there was a, a question in the chat about um, if I can find it. So Jennifer, I like the idea of a data marketplace, but it was concerned now that users will have to know that it's there and that the data can be found there, but you still need to go to other data marketplaces to get data that's not there. It just feels splintered. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, the thing that we found looking at Gabriella, um, because as we started working with uh, ontologies, right, and we started looking at edge and, and looking at relationships to our data, it's like it really becomes easy to find a path from any one concept to any other concept. And when you're working, it's like you can always find a way that one thing relates to another thing. And um, and so another kind of sideboard of discipline that I've tried to put in my own mind is national interagency wildland fire, right? So so we want to be able to deliver that. They use Department of Transportation data. Um, Google may use our data, but we're trying to work within that confines of interagency wildland fire data. Now, BLM or Forest Service or Park, you know, Cal Fire, they may have benefit from using some of that, but they may have other stuff they want to add to it. They may want to take some of our data and, and um, apply it. They may want to add some stuff to it, right? But can't we can't um, answer all of those issues, right? Like, so this is the place to go to get national interagency data. 
and the and so when you think about this it's even in here like if you think about the marketplace as the portal that you step into right so you open this up and you can now search for data well maybe one of the places that you're going to get pointed to is the NIFSI open data site and we're not going to change the way that functions at all because it works and it's got good metadata it's got things described well and so if you're looking for you know current fire perimeters you may find it in here but the link is going to take you to the NIFSI open data site so so just think about this as being like a like the center of a spider web right so it's got these tendrils that go out all over the place they're all linked and tied together and you can navigate them but they don't necessarily all have to be in you know munched together in physically so it's you know there's there's a lot of uh exploration and learning that we're doing with this so our first couple of years implementing IDME is really we're giving ourselves the time to learn and uh, and to work with our community right on what's working, what isn't working before we get to commit into something um, to some seven year contract or something right. So it's it's a big steep learning curve and the recommendations that the data architects have made. So when we talk about things like Snowflake or Matillion or What's the name? Harbor, Harbor. Harbor. Harbor right? Um, these are recommendations. And so the work that we're doing with Brad on the proof of concepts of Snowflake in the two uh, four service environment cloud environments is part of gathering the information to actually make decisions. And so while I would say I personally am pretty committed to Snowflake and Million at this point, I would I, if someone's going to have to come and say no for us to look at something else just because of the capability and some of the the way that it functions. Um, but a CIO could come back and say no. And so we would, like Carlos said, you know, the tools are all good. Some of them are slightly better and there are pros and cons and you just weigh those out. So if it's if they come back and say you absolutely can't use Matilia, then it's like, okay, well then we use a different media tool. It's it, you know, it's we can work around that. But these are the these are the recommend we we hired these data architects. To help us work through this and make recommendations and this is what they're recommending so that's how we're playing with that so i think that answered i think that was a larabee comment well i think an important thing on, on harbor versus narrative that we saw in the spring is the data doesn't live here in the website it's all just pointers or i believe narrative you were forced to actually load that data again so data marketplaces are, are still fairly new. There's only what four out there right now. Um, so I think that's great to kind of, I mean, when you ask people see this, they think of a hub site because it looks a lot like ArcGIS Online as well. Absolutely. As we started from a geospatial perspective. So I, I know the geospatial people are like, oh, we've seen this. Yeah. Out. It hasn't been available to non-GIS people. I mean, even though like everyone here can go into the NIFSI or like you can't, can't really take a feature service and open our pro and load it up and then change attributes or do whatever because that's a career field that GIS people do. So <clears throat> I can understand like how is this <clears throat> duplicative to the NIFSI or and those things, but like Michelle, you said it's going to be discoverable from here, like the things that we already have in our geospatial marketplaces. Um, and sometimes it'll be enhanced, like we have with the fire current data right now, but it'll be, we're making the geospatial data available to everyone here. So I don't know, like, and we're gonna have to figure out how people are gonna do it, and if they're just gonna be able to pass through to the services that we have in the NIFSI org, and you know, how it all works, but um, I don't think you have to pick one or the other. I don't think, the goal is to not miss any data from this one, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think mean, you're sent to the right spot. Yeah. And uh, Don, to your comments. Um, so one of the things about this is this, uh, you know, making the data available through the marketplace. So one of our requirements that we've had is that is that the majority of our well and fire data is open. And so as we've been talking to the Forest Service um, CI chief data officer or our chief technology officer and the CIO, you know. We've been really clear. We have 
non-federal partners that have to be able to access this data. And most of this data is considered open data and public. And so the part of the tools is that um, it, it wouldn't be that the, it's not a licensing issue for the states, right? It's like this data is available and here are the tools that you can use to access it. Um, and so it's, yeah, I don't know if that helps, Don. Um, the, the software, it wouldn't be any different than like you using IROC now, which is, Okay. Let's say service now. Service now. <laughs> I was like, you go first. I know. <laughs> service now. So it doesn't matter if the state has a license for service now, you're using IROC, and that's what's behind the scene on IROC. That would be the same type of thing here. It, it, we're, we want this to function in a way that our that whoever needs wants to get to the data can get to it. Data that is more sensitive, that we have a way of protecting it. So, like uh, they were talking about the um, the data that sh that was internal only, right? So then you may be able to see that that data exists in a catalog, but you can't access it unless you have authority. And there's a process for you to be able to get access. So this isn't just that we're opening everything up to the world, um, but that. We can meet both of those needs. So um, I don't know if that gets all of the chats. <laughs> so any other questions or comments on that? So comment is it, um, if we could get there as um, the authoritative data source, it would greatly help us when we do FOIA requests from Russian and the one that we're dealing with now, which has just been a nightmare, is NARA. NARA's come to us and said, we want all of your data. So now we're going, you know, all over to get this authoritative data source. Mm -hmm. So it'd be so nice to just be able to find them here. Yeah, so I mean, I can see, I can see like through something like this, right, that we, like, if we understand what NARA wants from us, then let's build a product. <laughs> and maybe yeah. only a few of us have access to it, right? But then whenever Mara wants their stuff, we just go, okay, yeah. validate that this is still good and then send it off, right? And, and so I think that that's the power that I see in this is that it starts giving us the ability to more rapidly control our own destinies when it comes to answering these types of questions. And how if we, you know, like how many times have we been in a situation where we get asked a question and so we send out a data call and we get this data back and we start going through it and starting to, to get the analysis done and they come back and go, oh, well, can you get, can you, you know, here are two more things. And it's like, okay, so now do we get to send that back out and get, you know, and so then, so there's all this back and forth. And so then we get this nice little answer and we have this little Excel spreadsheet sitting on somebody's desktop and then 18 months later somebody else comes in and asks a question and there's about a 70 percent overlap with that work that we already did but then we send out another data call and we start all over scratch right because we don't know who did that other one two months ago and whose desktop it's sitting in and we, you know and so it, in my mind I'm hoping that with something like this that we can start, it's gonna take time, right? Because initially we're not gonna have everything in there. So people have gotta be patient and be willing to come back and keep checking in as the collections grow. But eventually I, I could see going in and saying, okay, I'm looking for this type of data or this type of product and I want it to be able to include this information. And, oh, hey, here's one that looks like it's really close to what I want. And how do I refine that so that I can do this? And I'll say that so the next person that comes along can use what I already did, right? And so we start building this, but it it is that we will have to start disciplining ourselves to go check there first and keep checking back as the data grows. But I mean that's those are big, big goals, but it just feels like we all spend so much time doing the same thing over and over again or different people doing the same thing. Um, and I and I think this gives us an avenue to reduce that. We'll never get rid of it because we're humans, but 
Um, if we can start reducing some of that and start creating some reusable components and, and disciplining ourselves to use and reuse stuff, can help. Yeah, and I think I think that's one thing I would add. You know, there's always a lot of challenges that something like this introduces, and your brain goes to those challenges, right? You know, and on the other hand, I think what what I like to tell people is, what's the alternative, right? If you don't do this and you don't have this, what's the what do you do otherwise? And often it's like what Rochelle was saying. Well, now you got to go get data from somewhere. It takes a long time. It's wrong. You got to do it again. You you know, there's all the there's all these ways of working that we have. And so the idea is really to say, let's make all that a lot easier. But of course, being easier introduces a lot of other challenges, more tools that introduces, you know, new things and and more management, right? And, and other things like that. But you know, if you don't have it, the alternative is that this is, you know, the whole data space is only getting bigger, right? And it's getting bigger much faster than we can keep up with. So the idea being, you know, let's make, let's do this instead of the alternative, which is, you know, either think you don't have data because you just don't, or, you know, or, or you can't find, it takes you forever to find what you want. The other thing I was going to add to that is that, I, you know, and I think when I said it earlier about the tools don't matter, that's kind of a flippant comment in some ways. I mean, uh, what I really, I think what I really should say when I say that is that the data architecture is tool agnostic, really. If you have a favorite tool, if you have a tool that produces a great report, great map, or a great uh, dashboard, and keep using it, right? Don't, don't throw it. Nobody's here to say throw it away. I mean, obviously, organizationally, I'm not speaking to what you have ownership of and what you're licensing or, you know, any of those. Those are all other different issues. But the attempt here is to make this so agnostic that whatever tool you have, if it's working and it's paid for and you own it, you can use it. It's not going, it's not going to go away. Hopefully, it'll be, you'll be able to use it better. So on the agenda, um, question. Oh, okay. she's going to get to it, I think. On the agenda, we had that we were going to do some breakout sessions, and um, because of other things that are scheduled, we don't have other rooms available. And so, what I think I'd like to do is, um, we'll look at taking a break at some point um, because I think we built the breaks into breaking out of the sessions. Um, we'll, we'll take a break. And come back and then I want to continue this conversation. What I want to do is start hearing from you because I know we've like again fire hosed you with a ton of information, but we want to start hearing back from you, like what seems exciting, what seems terrifying, <laughs> what is confusing. Um, and ideally we'd love to hear like some use cases, like asking, like, how would you solve this or how would you do that? Right? At least. Well, just on the agenda, we had that you guys were going to go maybe over a high level roadmap. So just curious if that was going to be me. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I laughed a little bit because things that keep kind of going in circles a bit about like. What is, where is the focus? What are we building out after these group of concepts also? Getting the like, when are we actually going to have the environment and have a contract in place? And it's a big old question mark right now. Um, so, there's a session in this fall that you're doing and you fire environment business subject area to sit down and really look at. Um, the problem is, what happens when you have ID me is every everybody's like, well, my area is in here, mine's in there. And it's like, how do we want to use this environment is a really big question. Right. So what Rochelle is doing is starting with the Fire Environment Business Secretary to bring some leadership in to say, how do we collectively across this set of, of business processes want to transform like how the data part of it? Like what does it mean to have ID and me come in? And what are what are the possibilities here, and how do we want to what what does that kind of a roadmap look like? Because then that feeds into the IDME stuff. 
Um, so we're still trying to get it. Uh, you know, we, we keep trying to, but it seems like every time we start putting a roadmap together, it's more. Well, here's all the little bits we've heard, but there's not a cohesive like what are we trying to achieve here? It's all like little onesie twosie things that aren't heading towards. So we've still got to understand where is this all heading exactly of, of to achieve in some of it. So that's so that's my project manager's perspective, <laughs> <laughs> which is a very <laughs> valid <laughs> perspective. <laughs> yes, right. All right. So that's a so that's a very real perspective. And um, and so so here's the bus the business side answer of that, right? We're working through the project management part of it. We know we have acquisition issues and, and we're, we're negotiating those. So if I were to lay out the timeline for IBME, this is this is what I know today. We have concept that we're doing to test Snowflake in the Forest Service Azure and Forest Service AWS environments. So that we think is an important part of this process to understand a variety of things. First, we want to understand those are two separate cloud hosting teams and, um, and the Azure team is really new. The Skynet team has been around for a while, but they haven't necessarily, they've been really focused on application work and this software as a service big picture thing is, is different, right? So that's going to give those teams an opportunity to better understand what it is we're looking for and what the technology works, how it works in the real environment, right? But that's going to be a short, like probably 30 day type time frame, 30 to 60 day at the most to do that type of effort. Parallel to that, we continue the acquisition process so um so we've got contractors here so i have to be careful with that right but but we're in this process and um and so we're, we're that's what's given us this kind of window to do the proof of concept for snowflake but what we're hearing on both sides whether we're doing this on the doi or the forest service side is that it's it's reasonable to have something done this fall from that side contract wise or done Contract. So, so this okay. is going to be a multi-year journey. That, that's, what, yes. okay. yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like, We're on a great adventure. Yes. It's a whole group here. <laughs> the contract. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So the contract hopefully will be awarded by the fall. Yes. This fall. And so, so, so we're in, we're in a kind of a weird place, um, but we're close on some things, and and we have to like just be patient as we work through that process. But it's moving along and, and we'll get there. Um, on the business side then, thinking about, okay, how are we gonna do this? Because we've got this huge, like it, everybody's like, I want in, right? Like I've got this, I, I'm always getting, what about this use case? What about this use case? What about this data? How does this, how is this gonna work, right? So um, so our, our we're working with the fact that the predictive services oversight group has a, plan that went to the fire management board that's been approved that includes some positions and one of those positions, the number one position in the bucket two for PSOG was um, a fire environment data management lead position. And uh, and so there are wheels turning to get that position filled as well, which means then that we'll have a fire environment SME that's going to be um, focused on the data component of it. So they're going to help be building out those use cases rapidly. And our goal is to be able to provide value quickly. And so following that guidance from the predictive services oversight group work, there's been work that's been done on, um, what is it called? What is that? Chris, what is that thing that uh, Robin has been involved in the commission? The Wildland Fire? Well, Fire Commission. Yes, yeah, that. Um, so there's some recommendations in there around this concept of a fire environment decision support center. So we're looking at some of those concepts as well. And a lot of that's about data and data products. So that would be incorporated in what we would try and be doing. But again, at the end of the day, like how do you do weather stuff without fire current stuff, right? So we're going to get into the fire occurrence data, or, you know, how do you do it without fuels? We're going to get into this. All of this is really interdependent. And so 
we just want to try and be uh, as mindful as we can about taking reasonable sized bites. But while we can't put something up on the board and say, this is happening on this date, and this is happening on this date, and this is happening on this date, I am continue to be optimistic that all of these things that are coming from different directions are coming together in a good time. Like there's some synchronicity in how all of this is coming together that I think is going to allow us to, once we get the acquisition part of it done and the technical hosting environment decided whether it's AWS or Azure, then we're going to be able to start moving pretty rapidly. Um, and so my hope is that by the spring data summit, we're showing you some pretty real stuff. I mean, this is all real. This we could just pick up and move into an environment and it would work the way it works right now. But um, but that actually something that you as a user could go in and start clicking on and selecting on. So maybe just a little thing. <laughs> My hope is you'll actually be able to start touching something. So it's it's a it's a fun ride. Keeping acquisitions, budgets, technology, business all lined up together. But I think it's I, I think it's in a really good spot myself. So does that help Elise? Yes. Uh, <laughs> very optimistic of you. I know on the contracting front. Um yeah, I guess just something to think about when you're going through it, you know. Whoever is your first application or whatever that you start bringing in because I doubt you're going to be able to do it all at one time. I just right. said, right? So right. you just plan accordingly with them and when they do it because I know our fall and spring is unavailable. Yeah, anything, you, know, you know, and I and I think that so Carlos, that might be something we want to talk about because I think um, the, that ingestion part, right? Mm -hmm. So, so like how that works in a way that it's a is as non-invasive as possible for the applications. Like I, I don't want to have an expectation that, or I want to help people get over the expectation that they're going to have to do a whole bunch of work in their applications in order to be able to give data to this environment. Because that that's part of what we wanted with this is that we wanted to be minimal minimal impact on source systems, right? You don't really want you having to build a bunch of stuff for us to be able to get data. So let's talk about that after the break and, and some options for that and, and and how we might be able to help with that because I, I hear you. I, I I mean if that's the way that we were able to access data, this is this becomes like a 20 year project instead of a 10 year project, right? So there's better ways to be able to get data and, and work through how we do that from source systems without impacting your own department is, is important. Um, Steve, Danti, oh, you were responding to Steve Larrabee. Okay. Yeah, if, if, if we want to say, I can certainly address that. I, I share Steve's concern, but I don't know if we, it, it, if we want to spend a few minutes, I've I've been down that road. I understand what Steve is saying with that question. Take a look at it. Okay. If you want to set a few minutes aside, we can. Okay. So let's um, let's take a fifteen minute break, and then come back and and we'll have some more conversation. And then if you guys don't have more questions, then I'll start asking you questions. Oh, I have a question. Oh, good. I'm <laughs> We like questions. Give us questions. <laughs> okay, let's do 15 minutes and then we'll come back. <laughs> That's not a lot of traps.